Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me back. So I'm going to talk to you about bleeding coagulopathy today and specifically uh, we're going to spend a bit of time thinking about why coagulopathy is important in the context of major trauma. So looking at traumatic induced coagulopathy and there's some confusing terminology around uh, this and we'll hopefully try and clarify that. We're going to be spending a bit of time going through the European consensus on bleeding and coagulopathy and go through some of the aspects that are directly relevant to our practice in the UK and some which aren't. We're going to briefly go through TEG. Uh, Jim's done loads of great work on uh, TEG education and training at NUH and I'm just going to flick through some of our guidance. We're going to look at the lethal diamond which is an expansion on the lethal triangle that you'll all be very familiar with. It's something that I've mentioned before already and a traumatic aid memoir that I'm hoping to introduce into our major trauma theatres once I've uh, got a chance to get that through governance. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. And then we're going to finish off by looking at some of the uh, historic uh, studies out there on blood product administration and things that are happening at the moment and where we're going in the future with regard to whole blood in major trauma, which I think is really exciting. So I think it's probably worth us starting off by talking about why there's a problem, what problem actually is. Despite all of our efforts and all the fantastic work that everyone has done into managing major trauma in the UK and the major trauma networks and internationally, um, uncontrolled post-traumatic bleeding is still the most, still the leading cause of preventable death in injured patients. But it's not just surgical bleeding that's the problem. And Karen Brohe, you know, 17, 18 years ago, showed that, you know, a significant portion of our trauma patients who are coagulopathic at the point of hospital admission. So they're coagulopathic before we've even done anything to them, before we've really resuscitated them or let them get that cold or acidotic. So there's something about the trauma itself that makes people coagulopathic. We'll go into that in a bit more detail. And it's problematic because coagulopathic patients develop multi-organ dysfunction, failure and death more frequently than their counterparts with the same injuries who aren't coagulopathic. So the coagulopathy is driving morbidity and mortality. So we need to address it quickly and we need to treat it. So why does it happen? Well, there's quite a bit of confusing and overlapping terminology when we think about traumatic coagulopathy. And I want you to remember this term, acute coagulopathy of trauma. This is a umbrella term, if you will, that encompasses two main parts, trauma-induced coagulopathy and resuscitation-induced coagulopathy. Now, we're going to go into this uh, flow diagram in a bit more detail shortly, but traditional um, coagulopathy associated with trauma we used to think as these bottom factors here so you've got the resuscitation stuff where we give them crystalloid and we let them get cold and we let them get acidotic and that worsens their coagulation but you've also got patients who are bleeding out their clotting factors so they're hemodiluting themselves almost essentially and they're using their clotting factors to make clots but it's more complicated than that and I think it's worth us just going through what the current understanding of all of this is. So the first thing to talk about is uh, systemic endotheliopathy, so pathological changes to the endothelium of our blood vessels in trauma. And this whole acute coagulopathy of trauma thing is multifactorial. There's lots of things to talk about. So first and foremost, tissue injury, thrombomodulin upregulation and exposure of tissue factors sets off the coagulation cas cascade and causes endotheliopathy. The shock state itself, and remember that for some of our patients, we intentionally let them stay shocked until we get hemorrhage control. And we'll talk about whether we should or shouldn't do that in a bit. But that shock state and that hypoperfusion worsens endotheliopathy. And this endotheliopathy with the inflammation and the glycocalyx being damaged and the platelets being activated and heparin being released and clotting factors being used and hyperfibrinolysis upregulating, not unsurprisingly, leads to worsening coagulopathy. 
Then on top of that, we have the trauma and resuscitation factors we've already mentioned. So letting them get cold, giving them clear fluids, letting patients remain acidotic for too long, patients using up their clotting factors because of them trying to form clots and bleeding out clotting factors because they're exsanguinating. But there's also patient factors, which I think we're only just starting to really recognise. And you know, there's, there's a genetic polymorphism present where some patients, much like altitude and sepsis and hypoxia, are more predisposed to worse outcomes. Um, the same is true in coagulopathy, where some patients just get more coagulopathic than others, despite everything else being um, equal. Comorbidities, medications, the age of the patient, um, all these things feed into this acute coagulopathy of trauma. I've stolen this slide from from a talk that Karen Brohe gave a while back, and I think it summarises everything really nicely, where there's three main problems, three main uh, phases to a trauma patient, where you've got this kind of acute coagulopathy of trauma stuff, um, or acute traumatic coagulopathy, where the injury and the trauma and the low flow state and all that stuff makes them coagulopathic. You've got the resuscitation bit, where we give them blood and blood products or we let them get cold or we give them some crystalloid or they're acidotic for too long and all that stuff, um, including hypoperfusion of tissue beds, drives coagulopathy. But remember that patients also get prothrombotic. So we spend all this time trying to stop them from bleeding and give them the blood products and making them clotty, making them clot but then they get venothromboembolic events and PEs and DVT. So we need to remember that you know, once we get them through the initial phase, we need to anticoagulate them and pay attention to uh, prevention of DVTs and PEs. And the combination of all these things is what's going to get these patients through, through their major trauma um, and recovery and rehabilitation. It's probably a good time for us to move on to the management of these patients. And this guideline is fantastic. It's really comprehensive. Um, it was updated in 2019. It's on its fifth edition. It's a European kind of guideline on the management of bleeding and coagulopathy. And it talks about, it has this brilliant flow chart from start to finish, where it's thinking about patients pre hospitally all the way through to resuscitating them in theatre. So we're going to go through this uh, systematically. I don't expect you to read it, read it all. It's obviously quite a small print at the moment. So the first thing to think about is how we're going to initially resuscitate our patients. So we have trauma networks in place. We're trying to minimise scene time. We're trying to minimise the time from point of injury to definitive surgical control. And some fantastic work has been done there. And we know that we're improving outcomes. So that's brilliant. We're going to have early control of bleeding. We're thinking binders, torn cage, using hemostatic agents. We're going to pay attention to ABCs, making sure we've got patient airways, they're ventilating appropriately, which brings us then on to how we diagnose patients who are actually bleed breathing. So we're doing a clinical assessment and we need to recognise when they're bleeding and where they're bleeding from so we know what to do. So how do we recognise someone who's bleeding? Well, we spent a long time uh, speaking in previous talks about trauma shock and how to recognise the bleeding patient. And it's really difficult. And we're using shock index here at NUH, as, as other centres do as well, to try and pick out those patients who need uh, a red trauma core, or MHP activation pre-hospital, or the administration of blood products. And the parameters we're using are just unreliable. You know, the heart rate and the non-invasive blood pressures don't tell us the information we need to know, and it doesn't reliably tell us if a patient is hypovolemic. We need to rely on those softer clinical signs, that hate for late stuff we've spoken about previously, the diaphoresis, the skin pallor, the capillary refill, the cerebration, you know, entire CO2 trends, all that kind of stuff to kind of give you a feel of how volume deplete, deplete your patient is. And once we've recognised the patient is bleeding, we need to pay attention to how we're going to control that hemorrhage. That's often surgical, but there's definitely things we can do in ED when we think about binders. We also think about how we move the patient using the trauma mattresses we now have at the trust to keep the patient nice and stable, warm, and how we transfer them to CT and theatre. We're going to CT all of our blunt polytrauma patients as much as possible keeping in mind that we can continue to resuscitate a shocked patient in CT with the Belmont and the white team. 
that CT imaging, the pan CT is very valuable in the polytrauma blunt patients. We're going to do early tags. We're going to take um, blood tests um, and send them to the lab. And there's a few things we're going to look at. The first, I guess, is about hemoglobin. Um, is hemoglobin valuable in acute hemorrhage? I would argue no. I mean, this guideline does say that we can use it to help our, guide our therapy. I think it's valuable in telling us if a patient has a pre-existing anemia, and if they do, then actually their tolerance of a shock state is going to be significantly impaired. But certainly in the acute phase of bleeding, because you bleed all your blood volume, and hopefully we're giving blood and blood products, the actual hemoglobin value is, is unhelpful. It doesn't give us any indication of how much a patient's bled. Um, lactate and base deficit. So I think in the context of lots of clinical parameters and signs and tests and trends, it can be a helpful measure of um, resuscitation um, status of the patient. I think in isolation, if someone's got a raised lactate, it's, it's not particularly helpful. I mean, you can see raised lactates in patients who've got trauma injuries who haven't been bleeding. Um, there's lots of causes for lactate to raise. So, so it's context specific, I think is what I'm trying to say here. Um, we'll talk about coagulation monitoring in a moment. Um, platelet function monitoring, um, we don't do it at any rate. I don't, I'm not aware of many centres or any centres that are doing platelet mapping. Um, if a patient's platelets aren't working because they're absent or they're dysfunctional, maybe because of the trauma itself, then the TEG will show that their MA curve is reduced. Um, you can get platelet TEG uh, cartridges. I'm not sure how helpful they are. We've spoken about this with Cherry Chang before, um, and she's not, she doesn't think that they'd be helpful for the management of our major trauma patients. If we know someone's on an antiplatelet, then we give them the reversal of that, which is platelets, and platelets are included within our um, MHP packs anyway in a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one ratio, so we're not doing it, and it's expensive. Okay, so um, this moves us on nicely to uh, how we're going to resuscitate the patients and what we're going to do. So um, remember, we need to be thinking about uh, tissue oxygenation and low flow states. And remember that having a protracted shock state will worsen your coagulopathy. And we talk a lot about permissive hypotension and we worry we definitely historically worried about over resuscitating patients or rather resuscitating patients back to normality when we haven't got definitive hemorrhage control. Now the original kind of work on this was animal models, penetrating trauma um, and in those cases definitely delaying resuscitation until you got surgical control and then resuscitating showed a, a mortality benefit in a small cohort study. We've extrapolated that data into the blunt polytrauma model in humans. And I think we need to be really careful because allowing a patient to stay shocked in a low flow state uh, for a protracted period of time will worsen their multi-organ dysfunction and failure. It will worsen their coagulopathy and it will have an impact on their overall morbidity and mortality. And I think we worry about this a little bit too much because if someone actually has an arterial injury, um, they're going to be really sick and they're going to be probably unresuscitatable because much like we spoke about the arterial injury shock cases before, if you've got a big hole in a big artery, it doesn't matter how much volume you give, you can't restore repressurization to your arterial system and they just need surgery and blood. But a lot of our blunt polytrauma patients, probably the majority of them, don't have arterial bleeding um, from a big vessel. They have bony bleeding, they have venous plexus bleeding, they have solid organ bleeding, and they're transiently responsive to blood products. And resuscitation back to normality and normal-ish blood pressures isn't going to worsen, you know, their bleeding much, if at all, because it's not from an arterial source. And remember that a lot of our pre-hospital patients have, you know, by the time they've arrived in hospital, they're kind of an hour to an hour and a half down the line anyway. And if we allow them to stay hypotensive for another hour, then it's probably causing more harm than good. So I'm a bit more aggressive with my volume resuscitation than I used to be when I start to consider all of these factors and when I start to think about coagulopathy and what's driving it in these patients. Um, the use of vasopressors and inotropes, uh, I don't think the answer is straightforward. If someone's hypovolemic, 
they need blood and blood products. Vasopressors isn't going to help. The use of metalaminol to normalise someone's blood pressure in context of major trauma doesn't make any sense. You're, you're normalising numbers, but you're worsening peripheral perfusion um, and you're not improving your carotid, your uh, coronary or cardiovascular perfusion because the patient is just hypovolemic. All you've done is increased your afterload and decreased your cardiac output. There might be a role for inotropy in patients who have concurrent cardiac failure because of shock. Um, that's a complex topic um, and there's lots of work going into that. But in the immediate phase when they arrive in ED, if they're hypotensive, give them volume and leave the purple labelled syringes to the side because they're not going to be helpful. Don't give them crystalloid. Um, this guideline talks about aiming for haemoglobins of 70 to 90. In the acute phase, the haemoglobins are relevant. Having said that, if you if you aren't giving a balanced resuscitation, so you're not balancing your red cells and your plasma appropriately, you might start to see a drift of your haemoglobin increasing. And if we end up delivering a patient who's now normovolemic with haemoglobins in the 180s and 190s um, to ITU, then their viscosity is increased, their risk of um, uh, embolic events is increased. So just use your haemoglobin to, to kind of guide the balance of your FFP as well as using your TEG and try not to deliver patients who are polycythemic to ITU. Um, keep them warm, definitely agree on this. Um, we've kind of alluded to this stuff um, already, rapid control of bleeding. It's all about damage control surgery. So that surgery that's there for hemorrhage control, decompression, decontamination and stabilisation of musculoskeletal injuries. You're doing nothing else than those four things. You go into ITU, you're going to get some metabolic and physiological resuscitation and then we can come back for definitive surgery later. Interventional radiology definitely has a role if you've got difficult to reach bleeding surgical sites, if you've got arterial sources of bleeding where you think IR can be valuable. We're going to close the pelvis as much as possible. Binders are great for this. So good, in fact, that we often we can miss a pelvic fracture on CT. So when you release the binder, get a plain film to make sure it hasn't changed. Um, we've talked a bit about hemostatic agents already. Um, so use those if they're appropriate to do so, either intraoperatively or in ED. Um, and we're going to manage patients' coagulopathy by thinking about TEG, Rotem, early TXA, CRASH-2 quite clearly showed we should give TXA to our polytrauma patients. It should be given pre-hospitally. The second gram is over eight hours. A, a lot of trauma centres are definitely moving to a, a, the second gram being a bolus and ED for logistic reasons. And, and there is some evidence coming out soon that would support that. And I think pragmatically that will make our life a lot easier, but we'll wait for that to come out. Uh, crash three is all about TXA and brain injury. So if you've got a moderate or severe brain injury, give them, give them TXA. Um, I'm going to talk about TEG and Rotem later. Um, I'm going to talk about the eye tactic trial and what that showed because it's it's quite interesting, you know, when we think about the role of TEG and Rotem for these patients. Um, and we're going to give blood and blood products. So we're going to give it in a one to one to one ratio of red cells, plasma, and platelets. So hopefully lots of this, like none of this is, is particularly new information and, and everyone's doing this already. But I think it's, it's really helpful just to kind of recap some of it. So what are our, what are our targets? Well, I'm not going to give you physiological targets to resuscitate to because actually I think, you know, at the kind of one and a half to two hour point after point of injury, you probably need to be resuscitating to near normality. Um, but there are definitely some targets from a biochemistry and hematological perspective we need to be thinking about. So we'll do our tag and modems to kind of guide us. Um, we're going to keep the APTT ratios and the INRs less than 1.5. We're going to keep the fibrinogens more than two, the platelets more than 100, the calcium, ionised calcium and gases more than one, um, and we don't give recombinant factor seven in the UK. So these are some pretty easy numbers to remember. And these numbers will be on the traumatic aid memoir that I'm going to show you later, which I think we can have up in theatres. So ionised SM1.5, uh, FIBS more than two, platelets more than 100, and calcium is more than one. We can use, we use TEG here, not Rotem. Um, we've got some great guidance under this link. You can find it on all the trust intranet portals. 
Um, what does it show? Well, what does it say? Essentially, um, the rapid tag, so the one that you get back very quickly, if your R time is more than 120 seconds, the patient's coagulopathic. So you need to come back and look at the tag curve in another 10 minutes because it will tell you what you need to do. Um, if you haven't activated MHP uh, by this stage, then do so. Um, on the Kaolin curve, if the R time is more than 9.1 minutes, um, and again, the reference ranges are all on there, um, they need clotting factors, and they need that by giving FFP. If your maximum amplitude is low, the clot strength is low. And that's either a platelet problem or Fibrinogen problem. And again, the guideline goes through about how to identify which is which. There's some numerical thresholds in that guidance. Um, but if you just remember that the MA is made up of platelets and fibrinogen, so then you can start to figure out whether or not it's a platelet problem, a fibrinogen problem, or a combination of the two by looking at the fibrinogen curve as well. And then, of course, you've got your lysis at 30 and 60 minutes. And if the lysis is excessive, then we need to give more TXA. And they should have already had a gram by this stage, pre-hospital or, or in ED. OK, so that brings us on to the last bit of this guidance, which is all about anticoagulated patients. And we're starting to see this more and more. So if patients are warfarinized, we're going to give them prothrombin complex concentrate, so octoplex or beriplex. They also need vitamin K. OK, you can do this in ED. And as, if I'm correct, I think I'm correct in saying if they're warfarinized and they're bleeding, you can give PCC without haematologist authorization, I think. Um, if they're on DOAC, so Pixaban, Rivaroxaban, Doxaban, then we can give them TXA. We can give them prothrombin complex concentrate again because we think it helps. There's some evidence that it does help. Um, and there is a reversal called a Dexanet Alpha. Its trade name is Undexa, but it's not licensed in the UK, so we can't get it yet. The patient's on Dabigatrans for a direct thrombin inhibitor, inhibitor. Again, we give TXA, much like we do with the DOAX. And there is a monoclonal antibody, uh, it's difficult to say, um, The trade name is Praxpind, a lot easier to remember. That is licensed in the UK, it is available in the trust, it needs hematological authorization, but for life-threatening bleeds in patients who are on Dabigatran, TXA and Praxbind. And if they're on an antiplatelet, they need platelets. It's no brainer. Okay, so we're going to move on to the lethal diamond stuff. Um, this I've spoken about this before, but hopefully it'll make a lot of sense. We used to worry about coagulopathy. Well, we're going to address that by giving blood and blood products. We're also going to minimise patients' shock state and perfusion uh, improvement of their end organs. We're going to try and minimise that coagulopathy. Acidosis is um, a direct reflection on how resuscitated the patient is. So I think we'll forget about that and just accept that we're going to resuscitate the patients appropriately. Hypothermia is really important. We're going to keep them warm. And our new trauma mattresses are amazing for this. So remember to prepare the mattress before the patient arrives, have the beams in the mattress evenly spread out, have a sheet and an under warm, underbody bear hugger warmer. And then when the patient's ready for CT, take the scoop away, wrap them in the trauma mattress, plug in the bear hugger, and they'll be nice and toasty and warm. And this will really help keeping our patients preventing getting hypothermic. If we think about the lethal diamonds, we've still got the coagulopathy and the hypothermia thing there, but we need to pay more attention to the calcium and the potassium. So we've activated MHP, you need to pour in calcium to these patients, have your calcium syringes ready to go, set up a calcium infusion if you've got the um, access and the ports and the pumps available to do that, because they'll get hypocalcemic quickly and they need the calcium for um, their coagulation, they need it for the inotropy that, you know, they lose calcium quickly because of what we're doing to the patients. They also get hyperkalemic very easily and it can be normal, normal, normal eight. And it will catch you out, particularly when you start to give lots of blood products. And I've started running insulin dextrose infusions early on in these cases, just at a low rate, so 20 units and 50 mils at 50%, kind of five mils an hour, just to keep on top of the, cow, the potassium. And then if it does creep up, I can just increase my insulin dex infusion. And the potassium will normalize itself out once the patient's warm and resuscitated and all the, the calcium, uh, potassium leaches back into the cells, but just keep on top of it with your insulin decks. 
So this is what I would like to propose we could introduce. This is uh, taken from Coventry Trauma Centre with their permission. Um, it's just an aid memoir about things that we could be thinking about when we're resuscitating these patients in theatre. Um, think about TXA, you know, the one-to-one -one ratios, temperature, damage control surgery stuff, what the metabolic thresholds are, getting rid of vaso vasopressors unless you think the patient is actually vasoplegic, um, the kind of the coagulation thresholds that we're aiming or resuscitating towards, the role of calcium, potassium. So everything we, I've been speaking about speaking about already, but it was just a bit of an aid memoir. And I, I think this could be really valuable, really helpful. And I'm thinking we could put this up, big laminate in theatre one, theatre two, the new emergency theatre, maybe seven and 15 as well. Um, but would be interested to hear people's thoughts on this. OK, so we're going to move on to the last bit of this talk, which is looking at some of the historic, current and future uh, research ongoing. So many of you will be familiar, familiar with the refill trial. Uh, it is a multi-centre RCT of pre-hospital blood products use versus standard care, which was crystalloid administration in the bleeding trauma patients. You used to open the boxes and either there was blood and lyoplasm there or there was saline. And it was always a bit of a gut-wrenching disappoint disappointment when you opened it and there was saline. Um, what the study is looking at is uh, lactate clearance and uh, mortality in terms of giving either saline or blood products to these patients pre-hospital. Lots of air ambulances were involved. We were involved in the Midlands, certainly both East and West Midlands. Um, the results aren't out yet, still being analysed. I think it's fair to say that there were some reservations about the, um, the study in terms of how it was conducted. I mean, very professionally conducted, but the outcome measures, I'm not sure, will tell us what we want to know. The other thing is that all the centres that were involved in refill trial are now working really hard to get blood and blood products on board. And, you know, we're, we're actually nearly there with NUH providing blood and plasma to the local air ambulance. And I think even if the results of this study come out saying that there's no benefit, I think it's morally very difficult to justify not giving blood and blood products to a bleeding trauma patient pre-hospital now. So anyway, that's kind of where we're at with that. Cryostat is ongoing. We're part of this as NUH, so I think it's worth us just understanding what we're doing with this. It's an international multi-centre RCT, and essentially it's comparing uh, the use of MHP approaches, so the standard MHP resuscitation of bleeding trauma patient versus the same approach plus three pools of cryoprecipitate given within 90 minutes of arrival in ED. They've recruited over one and a half thousand patients. Uh, they're following up for 12 days, and they're looking at all cause mortality at 28 days and secondary outcomes are bleeding, transfusion, quality of life, length of stay and other complications like thrombotic events. Inclusion criteria are exactly what you'd expect. Adult patients who are traumatically injured, who we think are bleeding and have an MHP activated. If the TTL, the trauma team leader, thinks that injuries were incompatible with life, then we're not recruited into the study because it's not going to give us helpful information and data when we think about the primary outcome measure. In terms of what we need to know as an ethetist and what can catch us out, um, don't use the blood warmer when you give the cryo as part of the intervention arm of the trial. OK, and make sure you give the cryo those three pools of cryo in 90 minutes of arrival in ED. And we, it doesn't have to be an ED that we give it. We might have gone to IR, we might have already gone up to theatre at that point. We just need to be aware that the cryo precipitate we're giving as part of the intervention arm of the trial is, is intended. And just as importantly, you're not going to tailor the administration of that cryo precipitate based on what the TEG shows. The TEG says the maximum amplitude is normal, for example, you're still going to give it because the patient was recruited into that arm of the trial. The proper trial, so this is quite an old one now, um, this was really looking at kind of 111 versus 112 of uh, FFP platelets and red cells. Uh, the intention or the theory being, well, actually, the FFP and platelets are quite valuable um, resource limited expensive products and if we could change the ratio to make it a bit more red cell heavy then maybe that's a good thing um, 
the results were kind of a bit inconclusive, I guess. Um, there was no significant difference in probability of death. There was a lower exsanguination death and hemostasis might have been better, but the statistical significance was kind of borderline. Um, so the take home from this is we're just going to continue with the 111 approach. The PAMPA trial was a pre-hospital trial looking at plasma uh, by American Air Ambulances for patients with hemorrhagic shock. There were quite a lot of problems from a limitations perspective from this trial. It was unblinded. Um, some of the HEMS teams weren't giving blood, some were, so the comparator groups were really variable. Um, the outcome in terms of 30-day mortality and reduction in blood product use overall was massive. So massive, it's actually a bit difficult to believe it's all correct. Um, and keeping in mind the limitations for the study, um, it's been kind of interpreted, interpreted with a bit of reservation. Um, what I will say though, is that there was a recent uh, secondary analysis of the study looking at brain injured patients, and it also showed a trend towards reduced mortality in the brain injured patients with early plasma use. And I'll, when I talk about the ITACTIC trial in a bit, I think that's important, but um, a lot of HEM services who are administering blood pre hospitally now are giving plasma first, partly because of PAMPA, partly because of ITACTIC, but also because it makes a bit of sense. You know, these patients get coagulopathic quickly. We just need to give them clotting factors. Those clotting factors in the, in the context of FFP is a great colloid. Um, so you're going to volume expand them as well. Um, and that's what we're doing. OK, so whole blood. So this is really exciting where we're going to next in terms of the use of whole blood pre-hospital. Um, it's standard UK practice in hospital for us to give blood products, so red cells, plasma and FFP. And there's plenty of studies out there that show that doing this um, will reduce mortality and morbidity. What There's some military evidence, certainly during the Iraq conflict, that shows the use of whole bloods uh, may reduce 24-hour and 30-day mortality in traumatically injured patients. And I think there's probably a few reasons why this might be the case um, and why whole blood is probably a better resuscitation fluid for our trauma patients. So if we compare component therapy versus whole blood therapy, if you give all the components that are equivalent to one unit of red cells, the volumes are pretty similar. The hematocrit is massively increased in the whole in the in the whole blood um, transfusion. The platelet amount platelet amount is significantly improved. The coagulation activity. So, I mean, this was documented at one hundred percent. It won't be one hundred percent because um, you're going to cool down the blood and rewarm it again. Um, but it certainly won't be sixty five. Um, and the fibrinogen content is significantly higher, double that of component therapy as well. So there's lots of kind of hematological reasons why this makes a lot of sense as well. And it and because of that, it fed into the um, proposal to undertake a whole blood trial in the UK pre-hospitally. But before we could do that, um, we needed to consider what some of the problems were. So if we wanted to administer <clears throat> the equivalent of whole blood without giving whole blood pre hospitally we would need to cover, carry red cells, plasma and platelets. And there's lots of um, logistical challenges for us to do that. Whereas the administration of whole blood gets around all of those logistical problems from a storage, cold chain, safety perspective. And I've already alluded to some of the benefits of doing so. But before we can do a whole blood trial, we had to convince NHS blood and transplants that it was worthwhile investigating and, and part of that process was to roll out the red cell and plasma trial which has already been undertaken so that's just red blood cells and plasma reconstituted and the reason it, the NHS BT were reluctant is because there isn't actually an easy way for us to get hold of whole blood at the moment in the UK because their whole um, industry is built around is separating out those components so they would have to create a whole new process for us to be able to get hold of the, the whole blood. And this two year feasibility study looking into red cell and plasma has just finished. So this is what 
what was being undertaken or in terms of what's the process for the whole blood trial going forward. There were four, four work packages. There was the shelf life work, which was done in 2017. There was a feasibility study, which was being undertaken when I was working there, um, which has now been completed. There was the stage where the work package where NHS blood and transplant have to develop the whole blood component um, production line, which is ongoing at the moment. And then there's the whole blood RCT, which hopefully will be starting next year. The whole blood RCT will be an observational cohort study um, rather than an RCT. So I keep using that term, it's not an RCT, but it's going to be looking at red cells, red cell and plasma or whole blood traumatically injured patients and it's not just London Air Ambulance actually it's going to be across the UK and actually we've we've made a bid here in the East Midlands to be part of this trial as well so we may see some patients in the near future coming in who've had a whole blood administered to them. Um, the primary outcomes for the trial are actually logistical things around could the blood banks provide the blood when they needed it and what the wastage levels were but the clinical stuff which we're really interested in is all about resuscitation effects, so basic cess, lactate, pH, coagulopathy, how much blood was given total, mortality, complications such as length of stay, uh, clotting, coagulation, transfusion reactions. And it's going to be fascinating to see what the results of this trial show. And although the red cell and plasma trial, which was the feasibility uh, trial towards all of this hasn't been published yet. The, the initial results of those I've been told are really interesting and certainly have reduced the amount, total amount of blood products patients need uh, in hospital. Okay, so this is my last slide. Uh, so I've been talking for quite a while. Um, I just want to touch on our tactic because I know some of you will be aware that the, the iTactic trial, which was looking at um, the role of TEG and Rotem essentially on bleeding trauma patients and how that might impact total blood administration and um, hemostasis didn't show the outcome we were expecting. So it's a multi-center RCT. Uh, the primary outcome uh, was to compare, oh sorry, the primary objective was to compare the hemostatic effect of using TEG and Rotem um, guided transfusion strategy and specifically looking at how if the patients were alive and free of massive transfusion at 24 hours. Secondary outcomes are exactly what you'd expect, so organ failure, length of stay, um, mortality, et cetera. Now, there was no difference in the primary or secondary outcome measures between patients who either had a standard MHP approach, so one on one major transfusion protocol, or those who had an MHP approach that was guided by TEG or Rotem. And for the TEG and Rotem non-believers, you know, that would suggest, well, what's the point of doing the TEG and Rotem? It's a waste of money, it's not helping, it's not making any difference to these patients. And this was a big multi-center RCT into this. The problem is that because the comparative group was using major hemorrhage protocols, the incidence of trauma-induced coagulopathy was much lower than we expected, or, they, or rather the study investigators expected. And therefore the study is totally underpowered and you're never going to be able to design a trial that's going to be able to recruit enough patients to be powered enough to be able to show the difference they wanted to show. Because the incidence of trauma-induced coagulopathy has been significantly reduced by the use of MHP protocols. My interpretation of this study, though, is that if we put a te if we put a tag on and it shows a patient's got coagulopathy despite us using an MHP approach, then there's a huge amount of value in us nuancing those blood product that blood product administration to minimise the impact of that coagulopathy because we know when they get coagulopathic their morbidity and mortality risks are higher. The other thing to say is that this study did show that there was an improved 24 hour survival and reduced 28 day mortality in those with severe traumatic brain injury if you use a tag and rotem. And again, that just feeds into the, the signal that we're seeing with lots of trials like the POPA trial and the PAMPA trial, that early plasma administration in the brain injured patient might be really valuable. Um, and there's a fair bit of work ongoing at the moment looking at brain injury and blood product use. Um, so watch this space.
thank you very much for listening to me talk. Here's some of the references for some of the evidence we've spoken about today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.